legendary, world-famous ghosty mouthpieces. I, I bought it and bid it out on the on eBay. You know, those the legendary mouthpiece that that they played back in the 30s and the 40s and 50s, and it was really, really great. And uh, you know, I was afraid I wasn't going to get it, and I I got it for. Well, I mean, I, I won the bid. It's only three thousand dollars. That's really great, you know, because I. I've been testing it here, and and uh, I, I I know it's just a great mouthpiece. There's a few response problems here and there, and and it seems a little buzzy. But I know that's that's my fault. I'm just not adapting to it, and I probably need to make my reads better and stuff. And but I just think, man, what a great deal! Is three thousand dollars for a legendary ghosty mag ghosty Ooh. mouthpiece? Man, how do you beat that? I'm a lucky, lucky guy. Hey there, YouTubers. Well, the title of these next two videos, part one and part two, I'm, I'm yet to finish part two, um, is uh, the clarinetist vocabulary. But it might as well be uh, titled uh, Stop the Insanity. Or it could be uh, taken from uh, the old P.T. Barnum quote, uh, uh, there's a sucker born every minute. Uh, in any case, um, what I want to discuss with you is, uh, first of all, is to give you a, a vocabulary uh, for being able to think about and analyze your experience of playing the clarinet, whether it be what you hear or what you feel. And um, why am I doing that? Well, and actually, I, I've covered this subject before in an earlier video, but I want to go over it again because it's so very important and it will protect you. I'm doing it because so many people are being taken by, uh, by ridiculous things. Uh, and I just wonder what is wrong with clarinet players that they, uh, they're musicians and yet they stop up their ears and they choose something uh, because it has a reputation or has a label on it or something like that instead of actually choosing it because of its real performance qualities. Well, I think one of the reasons that they do this is because they've never thought in a systematic way about performance qualities. If you, for instance, if you uh, were uh, testing out a car, uh, you would get in the car and you would have uh, maybe even a list, but you'd certainly have some very specific things in mind about you know, learning something about that car. So you would test the car uh, as to what kind of pickup it had or how smooth the transmission was or how even the ride was or, or the gas mileage or uh, how well it cornered and handled and, and all kinds of things. You would test that and, and uh, when you finished, uh, you would know a lot more about that car and whether it was appropriate for you than you did before you got in. Well, you know, I find that clarinet players, they test things, but they have no idea often of what they're testing for. They don't know what they're looking for. They have nothing specific in mind. They actually know more about cars and how to test them than they do clarinets. Well, what I want to do is share with you uh, a set of um, criteria by which you can systematically go in and test any piece of, a clarinet, of clarinet equipment reeds, mouthpieces, bells, barrels, and all that stuff so that you actually get some real hard information as to real, the real performance values of something and not just uh, display it and think, well, you know, I, I guess this is great. I mean, it's, uh, it's what everybody played in the past and they, they, people said it was great and the legends of, uh, of the past always used these mouthpieces with this special rubber and, and this mystical quality and everything. And, and I know if I just give it enough chance uh, that uh, it'll make me great too. Well, this kind of thinking is just stupid. And yet, even fine clarinet players are duped with it. I'd like to share with you in this particular video, instead of objective information, just a few of my own uh, personal anecdotes, my personal experience with players. For instance, uh, I once knew a very fine clarinet player who had a set of these special legendary mouthpieces. And every time I would see him at convention, he would bring those mouthpieces, and he would constantly be nursing them and tweaking them with 
facing uh, things and this and that. But the fact is, is these mouthpieces weren't very good. Uh, the beak was thin thinned out too much, and the upper clarion register was very harsh and very edgy, and there was almost nothing you could do about it with facings. Um, and yet, uh, he would never give up on these mouthpieces because they had this legendary stamp on it. And I just thought, what a fine clarinet player this guy is, and what is it on earth that causes him to have the mental block to as to not to be able to hear the inferior upper register, the problems in the upper register, and how there's really no cure for it because of the design of the mouthpiece. Another story, a very famous professional, if I named his name, almost all of you would know instantly who I was talking about. He told me once, he said, you know, I have 30 of these, this legendary type of mouthpiece, and I uh, have them in a, in a drawer, you know, but I like the present mouthpiece I have better. Now the present mouthpiece he had was something you could buy, or I could buy, or anybody could buy, because to tell you the truth, the mouthpieces today that are being finished and made are better, more consistent than they've ever been in the history of clarinet playing, and we're very, very lucky people to have such good, uh, good equipment. Final anecdote is from one of the major symphony players in the nation. I got four of those legendary mouthpieces. He sent me a letter outlining each of the four and asking me to work on them. And I remember especially his description of one. This is, this is about 15 years ago. He said, I hate this mouthpiece. I paid $300 for it. And at that time, that was a fair chunk of money. I paid $300 for it. And it just doesn't play. It drives me crazy. See if you can do anything with it whatsoever. Well, those mouthpieces were all over the place in terms of their dimensions, in terms of their design. And what I've discovered from e examining some of these legendary mouthpieces by these legendary mouthpiece makers is they were tremendously inconsistent. Uh, the facing work was all over the place. And also, the shells were extremely different. These people got their shells from Carl Fisher mainly as, a, as the supplier, and uh, they got them in lots of a hundred or whatever, and they cost about two bucks each. And uh, at the time, this is back in the, in the late 40s and the 50s, very, very inexpensive. And um, they just essentially took whatever they could get from Carl Fisher, uh, from these suppliers, and, uh, and that's what they finished mouthpieces with. And, uh, you know, at that time, the only choice they had that player, most players had was to play uh, an HS single star that was badly machine faced that you couldn't drive a spike through, let alone get any air, th air through, or an HS double star, which you could drive a Mack truck through, which was also badly machine faced. So, you know, I always say in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And uh, what, uh, what the, these, uh, these artists' mouthpieces offered uh, to players was a choice from uh, the generally uh, uh, inconsistent and badly made mouthpieces um, that were on the market. So, and these are the mouthpieces now that people are paying ridiculous amounts of money for. Uh, and I have to say that they must have their ears stopped up. I mean, it's not that you can't find any of those mouth, some of those mouthpieces that are good. You can. But Lord, you have to sift through a lot. And I'm telling you what, with the mouthpieces that, that are being made today by makers like myself and other people, and even the commercial mouthpieces that are well made on the market, it's just insane to mortgage your house to buy something like that. And if you do, let me ask you, to use the criteria that I'm going to present to you in the next video before you decide whether to buy, lest you have serious, grave buyer's remorse.